everyone. Welcome to the University of Toronto Joint Center for Bioethics seminar series. I'm Angel Petropanagos, and I'll be the moderator for today's session. Our speaker today is Rea Hussein, and the seminar is entitled Research or Not Research? This is not the question for public health emergencies. Before I introduce today's speaker, I'd like to let you know that the seminar is being recorded. This lecture, along with other archived lectures, can be accessed through the Joint Center for Bioethics website. Now, the format for our seminar today is a presentation by our speaker, followed by a facilitated discussion period. To begin, we wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional lands of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce you to today's speaker. Dr. Rayat Hussein is a medical doctor by training who graduated from the University of Toronto Joint Center for Bioethics, Masters of Health Sciences and Bioethics. And he holds a PhD in bioethics from the University of Birmingham in the UK. He has been actively involved in teaching of and writing about medical ethics, law and professionalism, especially in the Middle East. He has been consulting for a number of regional and international organizations, including the WHO and UNESCO. He was recently appointed as an assistant professor in medical ethics and law at Trinity College Dublin and is currently a member of the Ethics Review Board of MSF. Dr. Hussein, welcome. Over to you. Okay, um, th thank you. Uh, and just thank you for um, in inviting me uh, to give this whole controversial talk today. So, uh, as just and you said, it's uh, about research, not research. This is not the question of public health emergencies. Um, let me start by acknowledging uh, the Wellcome Trust because uh, what I'm going to present today is a product of mostly the product of my doctoral thesis, which was fully funded by uh, Wellcome Trust. Uh, I was also um, supervised by professors uh, Angus Delson and Heather Draper. I'd like also to thank my friend and colleague. Dr. Khalifa Musharraf, uh, and because he has worked with me on, on one of the papers that I'm going to present today, Dr. Nama Somali is also we're working together on, uh, on, a, on a paper that I'm going to present some of the findings. Um, today, I would like also to thank uh, CRED, Center for Research on the Epidemiology of Disasters, for hosting me uh, for a full week uh, for a hand search in uh, about the study that were done in Darfur as I would present uh, later on. So how did it start? It started when I was in, in Darfur, West Sudan. Um, this region was and is still partially affected by an armed conflict. Uh, and uh, my role there was, I used to work for the Minister of Health of Sudan and uh, for the WHO for some time. Uh, my role was uh, to uh, manage the uh, a national survey and I was responsible for, for South Darfur. And there I had uh, encountered firsthand uh, the, um, how the people are uh, being introduced to, uh, to research on kind of studies that has been done um, uh, on them. And most of them were obviously about their humanitarian needs given they are affected by, by the conflict that they are affected in. Then uh, a year later, uh, I, went to this place and perhaps for the new generation of uh, the JCB that might not uh, I know it. This is the old building of Joint Center for Bioethics uh, where I joined the, the master program. Uh, at the time was led by Peter Singer and then by Ross Hopscher. And uh, I was basically introduced to, to, to bioethics and to, uh, to uh, research ethics and, and how, how Lisa should be ethically guided. Um, and perhaps it, it put me on the track of thinking about life in general and research in, in particular uh, from, from that perspective. It's about how ethical or, or how can we perform what we perform, do what we do in terms of research and practice in an ethical way. Uh, so what I'm going to present uh, to you today is perhaps a couple of working definitions. One of them is about the public health emergencies and the other about research. Although what research is perhaps is the meat of our discussion for today. And I cannot 
promise you any answer for, for this particular question. And perhaps this is one of the purposes is to leave you without a definition of what research is. And I will I'll let you know why. Uh, also, also, I'm going to uh, share with you a journey that kind of like spent through three to four years during my PhD and, and, and after that as well. Uh, and, and share with you some of uh, the methodological questions and some of the findings of the results that I come up with and how these results kind of like inspired me or perhaps let me think about um, the, the, the question that I'm going to present to, to you today and my argument that I'm going to present to you today. Uh, then I'm going to share with you what, what the paper said and, and I will explain that at, at the time and then what the people said. And then I have a few uh, take home messages and perhaps the discussion can, can lead us to, to think about what is the way uh, forward. So um, last thing first. So basically I uh, I learned from uh, a dear friend and colleague uh, Dr. Adlan, to start by the conclusion. In case you are watching just from, from the other side of the world, not in, in Canada, now it's almost well, it's, it's 9 p.m. and assume somewhere in the Middle East could be almost midnight. So in case you cannot survive the rest of the uh, of my presentation, these are the key messages that I'm trying uh, to, uh, to, to say today. So th this is the assumption that if activity X has to be ethically overseen because it has ethically relevant or unique or problematic features, then if activity Y share the same or similar ethically relevant, unique or problematic feature, then it should be also ethically overseen. And this is perhaps the basic argument, perhaps through, uh, through which I'm trying to introduce why research at the label or the name of research is not the defining feature, whether this activity should be ethically overseen or not. Well, uh, this brings me to the second concluding remark perhaps is, the ethical oversight does not mean research ethics committees or, or boards. And uh, through my presentation, I'm going to present to you a couple of innovative approaches that I have encountered uh, during my uh, doctoral project. Uh, also, I believe that as long as we are moving the, 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 the paradigm shift in research in general, uh, from moving from research on the people to research with the people, in, in, in many ways, um, whether participatory approaches or uh, different approaches where there is kind of uh, active involvement of the people in the, the process of research at different phases, starting from even from the research question and planning uh, until the very end of the process. So I believe that if we are moving um, the, 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 this paradigm shift from, from research on people to research with people, then why not research? So I believe that uh, also ethics should move from ethics on the people to ethics from the people. And perhaps I'm going to give a couple of examples. So perhaps these are the key messages or the, uh, the, uh, the concluding remark situation. Uh, this does not mean that you, you can leave the session now, hopefully not, but at least just to, uh, to give you the summary of what I'm going to, to be talking about. So by public health emergency, perhaps I have this disclosure, I have a disclaimer here that I'm using the term fairly uh, kind of, with, without discretion. It's not uh, specific. What what do I mean by public health emergency? And and even even the uh, the definitions that I have encountered anyway, they are not so specific. And we'll see a couple of them right here. So it could be either a national public health, health emergency or international of international concern. It could be. Um, uh, public health in the sense that it affects the public health uh, either directly or indirectly. It could also be natural or, or man-made because uh, perhaps the bulk of what I'm presenting today is related to the armed conflict, which is not a, the typical public health emergency when it comes to our minds. Public health emergencies, we usually think of like COVID or something like that. But I believe that it should go a little bit wider than that. So even in the definition, and uh, definitions that they have found, like it's an event or condition or agent which had the potential to rapidly harm and expose population sufficiently to lead to a crisis. Uh, the CDC defines it as a public health emergency, including significant outbreak of infectious disease or bioterrorist attacks. So 
even even in in that sense it's beyond the typical kind of like uh, the the infectious uh, diseases however i hope by the end of my presentation to find to give you the link between my project which was on a conflict affected area and the uh, the the wider meaning of public health emergencies including uh, covid for example so as a starting point i thought about this question, why, why do we need to define research in the first place? And specific, to be more specific, that's research. I believe that the, there could be many reasons, but, but somehow I could categorize the, the reasons why we need, or researchers need to define what research is, is either to, for fund, uh, for example, there's a fund for research. So if this activity is considered as research, then it, you can apply it for, for fund. But if it's not, then perhaps, you cannot apply for this fund or you can seek different kind of fund like the public fund for example uh, the second justification for for the importance of defining what research is is whether to decide whether uh, we need consent informed consent from the participants in these activities or not a third justification and perhaps this will be again the, the bulk of my uh, presentation and Part of my argument as well is about the need for ethical approval and perhaps this last part is the justification or the the stepping board for me uh, for for what i'm going to present today so uh, what i did is uh, this again was a part of my uh, my doctor uh, project is is to start by asking this question we have many uh, national and international guidelines for research ethical guidelines for research so i it, i was just curious if these guidelines define what research is what is the scope of of that policy or that guideline so i'm working with uh, dr somari on 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 this particular part this was part of my my my, my phd but again it's i'm working on it as a as a paper to be published hopefully soon so what we did is a kind of a Quasi qualitative systematic view, uh, if you wish, where what we went to uh, the international compilation of human research standards, which is basically a, a compilation uh, of the international and the national for more than 100 countries, including all the uh, relevant uh, research uh, laws and, 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 and guidelines. So, this as our main references, in addition to other. Uh, uh, references, for example, the TCPS and the uh, research governance framework in, in the UK and, and other guidelines as well. We tried to include, to make it as representative as, um, as possible. So what we found that uh, the, 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 these are just a sample of, of uh, the definition that we found. Uh, for example, in CIOMS, it's activities designed to develop or contribute to generalizable health knowledge within the more classical realm of, of research with humans, such as observational research, clinical trials, by banking, and so on. Uh, TCPS, for example, it's uh, the undertaking uh, intended, again, to extend knowledge through a disciplined inquiry and all systematic investigation. Um, any social uh, science, this is WHO, uh, biomedical behavior, epidemiological activity that entails systematic collection or analysis of data, again, to generate new knowledge. It's important to remind ourselves that if you want to define any term, then you need uh, necessary uh, conditions and sufficient conditions to, to make it a proper definition. So from here, we have two ways to go. It's either to work really, really hard on defining what research is, or perhaps uh, think of, of a different way to go through it when it comes to ethics. And this is perhaps I'm going to the second line of argument. So what we found that, generally speaking, most of the definition that we encounter are categorizing the, these features or to, describing research within these main features. First, it is systematically conducted. So it follows a methodological approach to answer a research question. Again, the intent is uh, generalizable knowledge, i.e. goes beyond uh, the, the group from from uh, from whom the the data were, were collected 
it's experimental in the sense that it is it's got some deviation uh, from from common practice. <clears throat> it also obviously it involves uh, humans. So uh, it, whether uh, this involvement uh, either by collecting data or or biological samples. Here the question comes whether these features within this th th that set of, of, uh, of definitions that we have found, if we apply them to other activities, we can easily find that there are many similarities between research and other activities that we do not call research. And however, because what we call research goes to the ethics committees and what we do not call research doesn't go. And whether this is the way that we should be doing this. So this brings me to, to, to one of the key messages here. If these are the features that make us think of this activity as an activity that should be ethically guided and ethically overseen. So what if there are other activities that share many, if not all of those features as well? So this is very important to consider as, as, as a point as well. So let, let me take you to, uh, to what the paper said. And by this, this was the kind of the conceptual framework that I have worked on. So the normative question with, with, with my project was, what ethical standards and procedures ought to guide the research that involves humans in situations of armed conflict? And as I said, armed conflict here is just a, was the case study, but I argue that, but I, and I believe that it can go beyond that. So what's currently happening, and I'm hoping that to develop an ethical framework. How did I do that? So what were the ethical issues? And uh, which ethical standards and procedures were, were, uh, were conducted or should be conducted? And then what is the status quo? For the status quo, I'm going to present, perhaps this has been my focus for, for today. I'm going to share with you the findings of a systematic review that I have conducted with my colleague, Dr. Khalifa Musharraf, and uh, the findings that I had from the empirical qualitative project. But I'm not going to share with you the ethical framework because the purpose of this particular, of, of this session is to uh, think about what research is and, and how can we, and do we need to call an activity research to have it ethically overseen? I'm not talking about ethically viewed and, and perhaps this is a point for discussion later on. So what, what we did is, uh, and this is this is published by in, in, in BMC Medical Ethics. <clears throat> so it's um, about the mention of ethical review and informed consent in the reports of research in that fall between 2004 to 2007. So what we did basically is um, that we had a systematic review uh, looking for all the studies um, that involved humans that were publicly available in uh, online. Uh, this, is, this was part of the project. The other part that I had to go to Brussels basically to stay in CRED where I had access to um, hand uh, or hot copies only. Uh, and the, uh, we had two, two main questions that we want to, uh, to see in, in this report. Was, the, was there any mention of the, an ethical approval of this study, ethically approved or not? And the other was whether informed consent or not. And, and we have justified why we have chosen these particular uh, two main features. And these were the findings. Um, so when it, when it comes to ethical approval, the online studies, there was 17, especially 12.3 of these uh, studies only mentioned that they, were, they have been ethically approved. And the, the, the hard copies that were found in Brussels, none of them said anything about being submitted for ethical approval. And for those who are ethically approved, there were uh, the few of them, these 17 were from University Ethics Committee, the, the National Ethics Committee and the NGOs Ethics Committee, and one in a private ethics committee. So we're talking about roughly about almost 90% of the studies did not mention, uh, I'm not saying that did not go for ethical approval, but they did not mention that they have got the ethical approval. And although some of them, of these studies were published in medical journals. 
And this is one of the points that I have discussed, that we have discussed in, in, uh, in the publication, in the article. Uh, in terms of informed consent, the figures were slightly better. So for the online, <clears throat> uh, almost 43% mentioned that they have got informed consent. Uh, for the CRED, uh, roughly 12% only mentioned something about having an informed uh, consent. Um, we have came up with five possible uh, possibilities why this is the case, given that the numbers as you can see below. Uh, so the possibilities that we have put is, these studies were exempted from the ethical review, and we have tried to, because basically we, are, we were dealing with the papers, and that's what I meant by what the papers say. So uh, we, we have we went through these, these reports and tried to find why they did not uh, mention uh, ethical approval clearly. So it's either exempted from ethical review or uh, mentioning the that this uh, report, uh, this study was, was, was not required. And the ethical view was not was considered by the researchers as if granted, and there were perhaps pre-approved proposals. And the ethical view was not part of the template used for applying for this research or for reporting these studies. Um, back to, to this, if we are um, like one way to think about these numbers, if I'm, I'm working from a very positivist, empiricist uh, approach, I would go and say like, okay, this is a knockout for the NGOs. You're not doing your job. You're not submitting your work on for, for research. And I remember one of the interesting, uh, well, comments that they had on, on Twitter, it says like, uh, um, if, if, it, if, it, if it was 70 years ago, it, they, they should have been in, in Nuremberg code now, in, in Nuremberg uh, trial now, because it's extremely low in terms of informed consent and, and its approval. However, I believe that what happened after that is what really matters. And this is part of the message that I'm trying to send and convey to you today, is that these numbers, because they are taken from, from the documents, uh, they tell us something, but they do not give it the full picture. And I will show you how, how talking to the people, to the real people, uh, made a difference. So. I went to the field and the, I talked to the researchers, whether, whether individuals or as institutions, most of them were affiliated with UN agencies, United Nations agencies and international and governmental organizations. I talked to the, um, to the governance bodies, whether the research governance bodies and the ethics governance bodies. Uh, at the same time, I have approached the research communities. Uh, uh, through mostly the, the IDP, the internally displaced persons who were uh, displaced uh, from, from their uh, cities and, vi um, and villages uh, because they were affected by the war, obviously, in addition to national uh, CBOs, the community-based organizations and non-governmental organizations. So what I found, uh, for them, they, 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 the, one of the main perhaps questions if you will, that I have asked them what they consider as research. And I have tried to, and because I have shared with them these numbers, the 0% the or the extremely low percentage of studies reporting on, on, on ethical approval. And the, I, I try to ask them, what, what, what is research to you? Or do you consider the, the kind of activities that you have been doing in research in, in Darfur region as research or not. So I came up with, and I will share with you some of the quotes that I have received, but the general features is that um, the what is research for them is what involves human participants. If there is data collection and methods, uh, methods and tools, the purpose of the activity the type of the data collected, and if the uh, the activity is associated with with risks, and there is, by the way, uh, a different set of risks when it comes to the because what we you need to think about risks uh, like the the emotional risk or the psychological risk or the stigma or the physical risk, 
but uh, there's a very interesting list of, of risks that they have mentioned. Uh, but again, this is beyond the scope of, of my talk today. But uh, again, this takes me to the point that I'm trying to make is when we talk to the people, they bring us new insights, uh, new thoughts, new questions to be answered. Again, this list of features, if we move, remove the word research, we will find that it, again, it falls other activities that we do in, in public health practice, whether during the emergency or not. So these are some quotes from there. Then uh, the original definition for research or health research includes any other type of, of research. What matters is that all of them have human subject involvement. So as, as long as, or as soon as there's a human involvement in it, then for this participant, it was research. No, I don't call it research, of course. I cannot call this research because by the nature of the conflict, you cannot perform the studies in their scientific precise way. So for this participant, what they have been doing in, in, uh, in, in, in during that emergency was not research because they were thinking about research as an academic exercise. And what they do in the field is something different. Uh, again, another participant, this is research. Definitely they are making use of the data. So I believe it is research and once being researched, not necessarily to be clinical, even on conducted at the community level should be, should have ethical clearance. And the participant, no, I don't call it research because the, the same uh, argument. So what uh, the, I believe that there are some lessons that we can learn here from and beyond the case study of the food. First of all, what I found is autonomy is not the leading principle. It was trust. Um, so for example, the, 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 the process of consent, it, it was not this traditional level, uh, traditional kind of consent that uh, either researchers tell you the, the individual participant in my study about my study and give all the information and then give the chance to ask questions, make sure that you have understood, yada, 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 and then you sign, uh, I give the information sheet and you sign to document the consent. It was much more comprehensive, much more sophisticated, much more. Uh, so as, as I put it, it's consent in conflict related studies can be described as multi-tier, multi-person and multi-principle community situated shared decision-making process in which the participants of these studies were verbally in, informed individually and collectively. So we talk to them in individual level and then they have their own gatherings where they discuss the, the newcomers, the researchers and the other uh, the humanitarian um, activities. Of the basics, just the basics, not 20 pages of a clinical trial or something. Of the intended study, either directly by the data collectors or indirectly by the community leaders. And the role of the community leaders and the faith-based, for example, organizations. Again, this is something that we may need to consider as well as part of the offer side mechanisms that we may consider when it comes to going beyond the research. Also, what I have found that the communities have developed sophisticated ethical oversight beyond the RE, DRE, CIRB model, the Research Ethics Board or the Research Ethics Committee and the Institutional Review Board model. So it is practiced within a com com community situated, trust-based continuum of approvals. So it doesn't work like that. The, 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 the role of the person, the, the individual perhaps kind of melts within the group, the community, or perhaps it's kind of like the, the moving from me to we kind of, uh, of, of, of ethics and kind of relation and autonomy, if you wish. So it's happening at one level of the multi tier approval system. This apparently uh, co complicated approach is meant to provide more protection and the collective decision uh, makes the responsibility for this decision collective as well. Uh, so this is a quote uh, here about the, the role of community leaders and how the decisions are made within these communities. So they, the leaders, gather the people. There would be an announcement that one of the organizations will be coming to you and then the people of the villages gather and wait for the people of the organization to come to them. And when they come, the people of the organization explain to the people their perception 
and then share their views on the appropriate option. So this is how it is described by the people. Uh, this is the kind of the, the ethical oversight, which is done in, in a kind of a parliamentary way, if you wish, because either researcher or media organization, we, we go to the, to the village or to the community and present ourselves. First of all, you have to gain the trust of the people, and then you can apply whatever kind of ethical set of principles or requirements of DILB afterwards. So <clears throat> when we ask the researchers, the, the actual, the, now the real people, right? Uh, about, about why didn't you submit your research for ethical approval? These were the studies, uh, sorry, these were the reasons that beyond the five possibilities that me and uh, Dr. Musharraf tried to, to come up with, I believe that the reason for not submitting these studies uh, for them is the, these studies were, were considered low risk. So for them, as long as it was low risk study, then why should I go for ethical approval? The ethical standards were followed without formal review. Lack of awareness about, about an advocacy for ethical review. The time-related justification, and I think most of the uh, the arguments for those who, who try to, to skip the, uh, the, the classical model of the mainstream model of ethical oversight is by saying that we are in a hurry, the, this, is, this is an emergency, including part of the arguments for the kind of study that were conducted during the, the, uh, the current pandemic, basically, and to what extent the, uh, the argument of, of urgency and emergency and the time lag, i.e. the time taken between uh, for, for proper ethical uh, approval uh, and the need of doing something fast. Uh, also, there was a confusion between uh, the, the role of the ethics committee, uh, which is focused on the ethical aspect of research and the approval by other uh, bodies as well. Um, there was also some pre-approval of the tools used and the NGO's reluctance to submit their studies for ethical review. So there was some sort of reluctance to submit their work. Um, so what does that tell us beyond the, the case study of Darfur or this conflict affected area? Um, so as we said that all the features, whether it is the, the, the set of features that were mentioned in the, uh, the definitions that we have found in the qualitative review or that that we have found in the empirical project as well, when we went to the people, that all the features that they have used to describe research to them, mentioned uh, to refer to research, apply to many other activities undertaking beyond the humanitarian settings. So if you think about COVID, if you think about any other pandemic, uh, we can find that uh, even, even our public health practice beyond the public health emergencies, I believe that there are many activities that especially in the US literature, no offense if any of the American colleagues are attending, this the huge tendency to, to kind of like find a clear demarcation between what is research and what is not, or what is public health activity, and, and, and the insistence that public health activities are not research. Why? Because they want, if it's research, then it should go through the, well, it should have consent, it should have, it should go through the, uh, the ethical approval and so on. But we have learned that uh, the, from our practice that this blurring of where to draw the line between research and humanitarian aid, because it was extremely difficult for me and I believe for other researchers as well who have similar experiences to, to make the people speak clearly about this is research and this is humanitarian aid. This is research and this is public health intervention. This is research and this is something else. So as long as we, we, we this blurring somehow uh, of, of where to draw the line between this set of activities that we call research and this set of activities that we call something else, did not stop the committees from finding a way to, over, to have an oversight on, on both categories. In, in other words, these community structures managed to find a way to provide, and it's, it's not just a matter of, of a naive way of doing it, it's, it's a well-structured, quite sophisticated, uh, quasi-parliamentary, uh, quasi-democratic kind of, 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 of discussion. 
about uh, whether they should open the doors of their communities to, to, to this organization or to that researcher. Uh, so I believe that, the, so what I'm trying to say here is, although they did not define what research is, they still found a way to provide ethical, meaningful ethical oversight, not only for, uh, and, and, and here we need to perhaps to, to refer to that the, the, the ethical oversight, this home in, in-house kind of ethical oversight, um, it, it didn't play by any book. They, I, I, I can tell you that none of them have ever attended a single lecture or read anything whatsoever about research ethics and the autonomy and all these uh, ethical principles. But still, they managed to find by themselves what are the moral norms and what are the ethical standards that they would accept. Uh, for for someone to to come for research or for aid or for whatever the humanitarian aid. So this blurring also applies to almost any other aspect of public health emergencies and beyond. So this is very important to 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 think about it as as not as as a disadvantage or or uh, as long as we cannot define what research is, then then keep the keep the status quo and skip the 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 ethical review uh, part. The same arguments for skipping ethical review are raised elsewhere. So uh, this is very, very important. Also from the lessons, and perhaps this is the last part of my, of my presentation, then we can open it for discussion, is that the flows in the mainstream review system represented by, for example, there, there are many literature, and I think you, I believe that you are aware of, of the literature kind of criticizing the, the, these mainstream models and uh, to what extent they are efficient in a way uh, that uh, why are we having them if they're not uh, efficient uh, enough or perhaps if you find a way to skip them, then, then do. Um, but I believe that the flows in the mainstream review, the, the committees based kind of uh, uh, of of re, of oversight does not make the label argument valid. Uh, by the label argument, I mean that uh, the insistence that uh, we need to label an activity as as research because when it's labeled as research, it goes to ethical review. If it's not labeled as research, then hey, we're 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 free to go. And I believe as professionals, we need to think about the ethical aspects of, of the activity that we, are, that we are doing. So if research is moving, as I said, from the very beginning, from being on people to be with the people, so should ethics. In other words, there are many innovative models of ethical oversight, and it's well documented in the literature, and it's been even uh, done before. And I think one of the leading examples, perhaps, is the lesson that we have learned from, from SARS and specifically in Canada and, and beyond. The, there are many lessons on how to uh, get innovative approaches when it comes to Ebola, to H1N1, H1N9, again in, in COVID. And I believe that we were kind of ethically ready, and perhaps not in terms of the magnitude of the problem, but when it comes to research, I believe there were many, uh, many models already there. And, WHO just all what we had to do is just open our perhaps old documents to find the the, the prescriptions are already there the models were already there and we've been discussing them and I, and I remember meeting Ross in, in 2009 when in WHO in Geneva to think about about that and there was also um, a, a training training handbook for research ethics during during emergencies. Uh, so ethical oversight ought to be a collective decision within a research-oriented social contract. Um, and, and this could be, um, again, uh, it's, a new, it's an idea for, 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 for your reflection, for, the, for, for anyone. Because I believe that our relationships between, we as, as professionals, okay, as public health professionals within, within the, the emergency context or beyond the emergency context, we need to have clear, uh, clear idea what, what the, the, the community is expecting from us, what our society is, is expecting from us, and we should respect that. And when we're talking about uh, this kind of 
research uh, oriented social contract is basically it's about what are the uh, what are the moral obligations on us as professionals if me as a researcher i as a researcher should uh, make sure that the research I'm doing is, is ethical, but the ethical guidelines were set by a group of academicians, mostly white men, no offense for the white men attending. Uh, but uh, the, the, this was, most of them are done this way. So, yeah. Uh, so uh, the, the, this is the way forward, I believe, that we need to think about what the people need to know. Uh, we need the moral imagination and the moral courage to go beyond the ethical cliches. Uh, we feel we have our comfort zone, but I believe that we need to go beyond this comfort zone to move to a more viable, reliable, trustworthy, sustainable model of ethical guidance and governance. And I believe that if the people of Darfur could do it, and I believe any community in the world can do it. So this is perhaps the main messages and the main uh, I, and I assume that, that I have put more questions than answers, but again, this is for our shared wisdom. Thank you. Great, thank you so much for that. That, was, that gave me lots to think about. Admittedly, I haven't thought about the um, concept of uh, ethics with the people before in the context of research. So I think that's, that's really exciting and I'm looking forward to the discussion. So, um, uh, for those of you watching on YouTube, I'll just let you know that um, if you are logged into YouTube, you're able to submit your questions um, in the YouTube chat. And uh, if you would like to, log to ask a question anonymously or you're not logged into YouTube, you can send an email to lori.bolchak at utoronto.ca. And I think Lori has put her email address and information in the chat below so you can find the spelling there. Um, and we will, I'm gonna open up our questions here and see what we have. Let's give everybody a minute to, to enter their questions. Okay, so, um, so we have a question from Rebecca. She asks, um, she says the main motivator to go through REB is to be able to publish. This is because many journals uh, require either REB or a specific exemption from REB. So how do you suggest that we, and I think she means researchers, uh, manage this? Um, well, uh, this is part of, I won't say the flows of the system, but uh, it, it is what it is. We have to deal with it and we have to live with it. I understand why the medical journals are uh, having this requirement because they want to make sure that uh, what you did was ethically approved and by ethically approved, it, uh, it followed some sort of ethical guidance. So what I'm, when I talk about the innovative approaches, we're not talking to, uh, about getting rid, rid completely of the, the previous model, because this is a model that we can, it's structured, it's affiliated to an institute, so I, can, I know what is the process of applying for an ethical approval. But what I'm trying to, and, and by the way, for my projects as well, I have applied for uh, the ethical approval at uh, the University of Birmingham and then uh, in Sudan as well. So I had to go through the same process. And I'm not asking anyone to, st to stop it, but perhaps it's just to have the moral imagination, the, 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 the ability to think about that there are other ethical principles somewhere else, there are other structures somewhere else that we need to be aware of, or at least to be respectful for. Uh, so I'm, I'm, yes, we, we need to keep doing this. And, and I think it's uh, important self measure when it's come to journals asking the researcher to to show some evidence that they, they, their work was, was either exempted from ethical review or ethically reviewed. Yeah. Our next question is from Andrea. Um, she says, thank you, Dr. Hussain, for this interesting talk. One of your slides titled Lessons from and Beyond Darfur said that autonomy was not the leading principle, it was trust. This slide stated that research consent was obtained either directly by data collectors or indirectly by community leaders. And she says, I'm curious about what is meant by indirect consent. What does obtaining consent indirectly by community leaders mean? Um, for instance, rather than getting consent from participants, would community leaders get assent? Um, or does indirect consent mean uniform consent? Uh, it, it's... 
I'm not it's hard to explain, but but let's think about it like a debate in the parliament, if you wish. So what happens is you propose something, uh, what you to 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 have access to, to to this particular community. What happens is you need to talk to the community leaders first. Then the community leaders kind of gather the the representative of the village uh, in a in a mini parliament, and then they introduce me to to the village that this is Dr. Uh, Hussein, if he wants to provide this or to ask you about this and so on. So I explained to them in, in full details, as simple as possible, obviously, the details of my uh, of my study. So this is what I, this is the general acceptance just to open the doors. Then when you go to the specific household, to the selected household, you talk to the people about, then it, it becomes the direct consent as perhaps as we are familiar with. And uh, we tell them individually that now you are invited to participate in this study because of this and this. And, and then it shifts from this kind of collective initial agreement the, to the individual uh, model. So it, it's kind of a mix of both. Uh, I hope this made things a little bit clearer on how, 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 did, how did it go. Uh, so the, it's very important to emphasize here that the role of the, the uh, community leaders was not to have uh, a proxy consent or consent on behalf of the people. They are more or less just, they were described at the gates. It's just the gates the, to, to, because you, you need to, to show that you are trustworthy. And we are introduced to the community through the community uh, leaders. Then your trustworthiness, if you wish, credit increases because you came through the right gate. You did not just parachute and start knocking on their doors. They, otherwise, it's very, quite unlikely that you will not be uh, received well. I'm really interested in um, the, the role that trust plays in this. And I think um, through the pandemic in particular, we're learning just how important trust is and the relationships of trust. And I think that's really what um, facilitates um, or is a barrier to oh, the lack of trust is a barrier to- and I, um, Yes, I, I, I totally agree. I think, I think COVID is a, is a great lesson in, in terms of the need to shift our, to rethink, reshuffle our, the priorities that we give to the ethical principles, uh, or to refer to the ethical cliches in a way. So perhaps this respect for individualistic approach to autonomy, I believe that it's, if, if COVID did not teach us anything else except for that this is the time to th rethink about and reprioritize our ethical principles, that now we can see the importance of trust. Now we see the importance of the collectiveness or the solidarity, for example, the collective decision-making process that we do as a community. It's not a matter of my decision to, to be vaccinated or not, to wear a mask or not. This is a decision that we as a community need to take, to, to take together at the same time to have the, the best outcome for everybody. So the, the kind of individualistic approach to autonomy compared to relational autonomy or perhaps the concept of trust and solidarity. And I believe that the ethics literature, I hope actually after, after, with COVID and after COVID, it will, we will see perhaps new kind of blood, new blood basically in, in, in the veins and arteries of um, ethics literature, hopefully. So I'm wondering with, with trust, um, so, so one way you described the establishment or, or the beginning of trust was that you were going through the right mechanisms. You were going to the community leaders, not just parachuting in and trying to get directly to the, uh, the individuals in the population. So I'm wondering, um, was it important that there was a pre-existing relationship of trust between the researchers or um, somebody they knew with the community leaders? Or um, in the work that you did, did you see trust was often sort of that, that initial contact was the beginning of trust building? So it wasn't established, but it was sort of the process of building it and a process in research um, of those relationships sort of forming and building. Uh, it, it was kind of a mix of both in a way, uh, because uh, uh, as I said, it's uh, the the traditional approach of, of knocking on people's doors would not work. And uh, it, it, it happened actually that um, you, you're not even welcomed in the whole community and you are just blocking yourself and blocking your study from from proceeding. So um, when you talk to the, to the uh, and, and by the way, they will have like, again, it's, it's very much like a parliament where, where uh, you know, the, the MPs ask the, uh, 
they minister very tough questions about, okay, what is your plan about this? What's your plan about that? What's your intention about this? What's your intention about that? So there are a set of questions that the, the community leaders and the people of that community ask about, about your intentions, about your, for example, who's funding your project and uh, what 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 would we have in, in return? And again, we have to be honest about. I don't have something physical to provide to you. Uh, although I I understand that there you have physical needs like food, shelters, or kind of air uh, aids that in, uh, something tangible uh, that they cannot provide and they should not provide given the consent that they have given uh, or the the approval that I had from the uh, from the IRBs. So I think it's it, this kind of when you are open and and uh, answering the questions in, in a transparent way, this is how you build up your uh, trustworthiness. And and then, as I said, it this is just like a if you pass this test, the 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 gate opening test. Then when you go to the community, it's again between you and this household and this this family or this person in their in their household. Yeah, and, and you have to build it and maintain it as well. Thank you so much. Um, so our next question is from Louise, um, and they ask, um, but with people, um, can, so people can, mean, they can lobby, um, so different groups could lobby over the vulnerable groups, um, and they're worried about lobbying and how this could be managed. Um, and, and maybe I'll add, um, sort of in that process of building a relationship of trust and maintaining it, um, if you could also say a bit about um, where it's sort of, the, how the conflict is managed in those situations too. So concerns about lobbying and how that's managed and then sort of as issues arise in research on um, how that's managed as well. Uh, it's, it's a tough one. And um, one of the interesting things that uh, uh, that we had a, a week ago, there was a discussion about MAID uh, and, and we we're discussing by the way the Canadian model and whether it could be applicable in Ireland. So one of the things that uh, was mentioned that uh, the majority rules only in politics when it comes to ethics, the minorities should be listened to first. So I think this is one of the key messages perhaps is not a the we, ethics is not, should not be following those who have who are the vocal ones or perhaps the, 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 the power of, uh, of uh, the, the lobbies basically. I'm not, I'm, I have nothing against lobbying. Lobbying for, uh, it, it works, it helps the people who might not uh, be well heard without without the the effort of of that of that lobby. But but what I'm saying is, we need to put the 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 big picture as a whole first. So and to see whether what is being lobbied for, advocated for, fits within the general agreement of the community about this set of of principles and approaches uh, to uh, to research and how to proceed with them. Uh, so yes, we have to be careful about that. And perhaps this brings me also to the point that the importance of maintaining the, the current uh, structured systems in terms of having the research ethics boards in place and not considering the, the community approval as a substitute of the, the structured institutional model, because the institutional the structured model is the one perhaps is more capable of dealing being aware of uh, that this is um, uh, a pressure group, this is a lobby, they are, they are advocacy group, and they will have the ability and perhaps the, the power to know where to stop and what a, when, it's, when it's about ethics, when it's about the people or when it's about something else. And um, I think we have time for one more question and uh, it might be a big one. Um, so this question is from Roth, by Roth Upshur um, and also he adds that it's great to see you. Um, so Roth asks, what steps do you think need to be taken to implement some of the recommendations that you make? How can institutions and global health aid in this? Uh, well, uh, the, the, I think it's, a certain point would be flexibility. Uh, because one of the things that, that one of the problems that I had with the with the uh, research ethics committee in, in the university is to convince them that it doesn't work like that. I mean, they, they still want to go by the book, which is kind of the Western book. When, when it comes to global health, I believe that we need to get exposure 
we need to talk to the local communities. Uh, we need to uh, the raise awareness of our researchers in the Western countries uh, of, of these different um, aspects. Moreover, I believe that if we endorse this kind of talking to the people and and don't don't stop where the papers say, but also go to the people and try to understand understand them so it's, i think it's, it's a long a long long process but it, it and it's a learning process uh, but eventually i believe that at one point of time i can imagine that the uh, reds and uh, are working uh, in a flexible way to to uh, to endorse the the different possibilities that the researchers can can have in different places and perhaps have a less strict model of consent and how to take it and more flexibility, and we have started doing doing and seeing this uh, as well. So, to uh, to well, in summary, I believe that exposure to international uh, international exposure, uh, learning from developing countries, and let our researchers go to different places and and our communities as well to get exposed to uh, different cultures when it comes to uh, to ethics and and how different communities could be having uh, or could be regulating their their uh, have different set of ethical principles and applying them within their context in their own ways maybe i'll sneak one more question in um as i know we've been um, thinking about reimagining ethics in research and um we've been talking about ethical principles um, but principalism is just sort of one way to approach ethics and i'm wondering from the work that you've done um if um, you've seen sort of uh, other models that you want to sort of draw attention to that might be uh, worth considering um, in sort of next steps. Um, uh, well, I, th I think that, as, as I said, that there have been already quite a few of them. The in innovative models, for example, uh, when it's come to the uh, to addressing the, the pandemics, for example, they, they are already there. So I'm not I'm, I'm not worried about the the practical aspects of it, but perhaps about the ethical guidance or the ethical principle that guide these processes. Uh, so we have the models, but I think that what we are missing now is to have this kind of global thinking of global ethics in in its in its wider sense. So what I do encourage people to to perhaps to read more about the 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 philosophies in, in other cultures, the, the ethical standards in other, in, in other cultures, how different people in the world tell right from wrong, uh, basically. So I think this, this kind of exposure, and, and I think Toronto and, and Canada in general is a very multicultural place where, where we, we can easily find people from different, from almost all corners of the globe talking and willing to, to we need to encourage the students and, and colleagues to talk about what, where they come from and what and how things happen in their in their context. Just hopefully this would make life easier for for the other researchers when they go to these places. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. You've given us a lot to think about. Uh, so on that note, um, unfortunately, it's time to draw today's seminar to a close. And I just have a couple of announcements to make before we, we thank you, Rash. Um, our next event is part of the lecture series on ethics and governance of AI health, and it'll take place on Tuesday. November 23rd at noon. Um, and this will replace uh, next week's Wednesday seminar. So uh, mark it in your calendars if you haven't done so already. It'll be on Tuesday, November 23rd at 12 p.m. And Effie Vayana will be discussing health, AI, ethics, and governance, the WHO guidance, can it make a difference? She will be joined by panelists Angela Power and Jeremy Petch. To sign up to receive our weekly seminar reminder emails, please email jcb dot info at utoronto.ca. And for the CSB students enrolled in the CSB student seminar course, please remember to keep track of your attendance. And uh, last but certainly not least, Beth, on behalf of all of us here today, thank you so much for your presentation. It's really great. Th thank you. Thank you, Angel, for, uh, for your moderation. And thanks for everybody. Thanks for us. I'm glad to kind of read from you, at least. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.